It only took 30 seconds for him to shoot one of Britain's most recognizable faces dead in broad daylight, then simply walk away. It was a sunny spring day in 1999 and all seemed right in the world, but on the quiet leafy streets of Fulham, London, a shocking event was about to unfold that would shake the nation to its core. As beloved BBC television presenter Jill Dando stepped up to her front door, she was suddenly and brutally murdered, leaving behind a mystery that would captivate the public for years to come. Who could have committed such a heinous crime against such an innocent and well-loved figure? And why? As the investigation unfolded, it became clear that this was no ordinary murder case, with false leads, mistaken witnesses, and a suspect who seemed too good to be true. The police were faced with one of the most complex and challenging investigations in recent history. Let's recap. I'm Chris, and I just wanted to take a second to thank you for watching True Crime Recaps. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, it would mean a lot to us if you gave this a thumbs up and maybe even share our channel with a friend or two. Thanks again. Now, on with the recap. It's 11.30 a.m. on April 26, 1999. Richard Hughes hears a car pull up. Seconds later, a woman gives out a startled scream. When he glances out his bedroom window, he sees a man walking away, quickly. He only gets a look at his profile, but he registers his appearance. White, thick, dark hair, somewhere around 30 or 40 years old. Average height, about 6 feet tall, not fat, not thin, smartly dressed in a dark jacket. Another neighbor notices the same man. Now, they don't know it at that moment, but these two witnesses just saw Jill Dando's killer. At 37, Jill was one of the UK's most beloved television personalities, known for her warm and down-to-earth manner. So, when she was shot dead on the doorstep of her home in London, it sent shockwaves through the country. Fourteen minutes later, Jill's neighbor, Helen, spotted her body on the porch, now, Jill didn't even have the chance to open her front door. It was a bold move by her killer. It's a busy street with townhouses built right next to each other, but with the weapon pressed tight to her left temple when it fired, no one heard the shot, and the killer walked away clean, latching the gate behind him. Jill was rushed to the hospital, but she never stood a chance. The police were faced with a puzzling crime scene and no obvious motive or suspect. One theory was that Jill's murder was connected to her work on the BBC show Crime Watch. The program was well known for its ability to help solve crimes and track down dangerous criminals. Did the killer appear on the show? Did he blame Jill for his capture? Another theory was that Jill's death was the result of a professional rivalry. She was at the top of her game with a successful career and a bright future ahead of her. Did she have a jealous rival? Was someone driven to take out the competition? Over and over, the police came up empty. How do you narrow down the suspect pool for a victim millions of people knew by name? More than a year passed. It was beginning to look like it might never be solved. Then, in May of 2000, a man named Barry George was arrested and charged with Jill's murder. Barry George lived close to Jill's flat in Fulham. As a kid, he came off as weird but harmless. He dressed like his favorite celebrities and insisted on being called by their names. When he got older, his obsessions turned darker. He had his sights set on being a cop, and they turned him down, but he didn't take no for an answer. He faked a badge and used it to get close to women until he got caught. He just got more aggressive. Barry fixated on Freddie Mercury, even changing his last name to Bulsara, Freddie Mercury's real name, so he could pretend to be his cousin, Barry Bulsara. He showed up at Freddie Mercury's house on the first anniversary of his death, according to The Guardian. Passing out business cards with the words Bolsara Productions, he signed autographs, telling visitors he was Freddie Mercury's cousin. Then his behavior got downright dangerous. He was accused of stalking at least 13 women and harassing and following hundreds more. Among them was Princess Diana. He somehow got past the gates at Kensington Palace, where police found him in army fatigues and a ski mask clutching a knife. Over the years, Barry did prison time for attempted sexual assaults. A note found in his flat read, I have difficulty handling rejection. It starts a chain of events I can't control. 
Police wondered, is that why Jill Dando was killed? There was very obviously something not quite right about Barry, but doctors were divided on what exactly it was. A personality disorder, sure, but which one? Diagnosis ranged from histrionic and narcissistic to paranoid and psychopathic. One neighbor told the Guardian Barry followed her home, saying, Now I know where you live. Years later, he was still at it, leaving her a note that said, I like blondes. Speaking of pretty blondes, Jill Dando was in love. She put her townhouse up for sale and was planning a move out of Fulham. As it was, she was hardly ever there. She spent most nights with her fiancé, Alan Farthing. Now, her last night on Earth was no exception. Alan and Jill met on a blind date in 1997. He was a newly single, renowned gynecologist, even treating the ladies of the royal household. She was looking for love. They got engaged a year later. On that last morning, Jill made Alan breakfast before he left for work. A couple of hours later, CCTV picked up Jill at a shopping center before going home. Just running some mundane errands, picking up ink for her printer, some fish for dinner. It didn't look like anyone was following her. How did her killer know she would be at her house that morning? Barry George swore up and down he didn't know her, but his obsessive behavior and his record of stalking and sexual assault made him look good for it. Maybe too good. There was nothing connecting him to Jill Dando, no forensic evidence linking him to the crime scene. The neighbor who saw the alleged killer did not pick Barry out of a lineup. There was no smoking gun. There was nothing but the fact that he just seemed like the type. In the summer of 2001, that was enough. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, but his conviction was eventually overturned on appeal. In 2008, he was acquitted at retrial and set free. As of 2019, Barry was living in Ireland. So, if Barry didn't do it, who did? Theories about potential suspects went international. If you're a history buff, you may know the United States and NATO supported Kosovo in the war against Serbia in 1999. And what does that have to do with a famous journalist 1,600 miles away? Well, maybe everything. Three weeks before she died, Jill appeared on TV appealing for aid for refugees from Kosovo. Three days before her shooting, the headquarters for radio television of Serbia, RTS, was bombed. Sixteen journalists died. In the days after the attack, the BBC fielded two anonymous calls from Serbian groups alleging the murder of Jill Dando, the de facto face of the BBC, was retaliation, possibly ordered by Serbian warlord Arkin. Could it be true? Was her murder politically motivated? It's possible the bullet that killed her was fired from a converted gun, possibly one made for close-range executions, the kind of thing used by Serbian hit squads. It's never been found. A blue Range Rover illegally parked on her street that morning could be connected. Maybe the shooter's accomplice parked and waiting for Jill to pull up in her BMW. The same type of car was seen speeding away from a street near the crime scene, but its driver has never been identified. Another theory involves a different blonde journalist at the BBC. Lisa Brinkworth went undercover to expose alleged sex crimes in the elite model management agency in 1998. That's when she was also allegedly victimized at the hands of the agency head. Gerald Marie, a man who was accused of sexual assault by several other women. Did he order a hit on Lisa Brinkworth to silence her? Court documents filed in the French investigation into Gerald Marie reveal details of an alleged conversation between him and a Russian mobster ordering the hitman to deal with the problem. Unfortunately, the mobster took out the wrong blonde. Lisa Brinkworth and Jill Dando were the same age and looked a lot alike. They had a lot of other things in common, too. They were both journalists at the BBC. They both lived in the same area in London. And bizarrely, they were both close to Alan Farthing. Lisa was his patient. Could Jill Dando's death have been nothing more than a case of mistaken identity? Gerald Marie denies a conversation like that ever took place, and the statute of limitations ran out on several of the assault allegations against him. So, many of those charges have since been dropped. And investigators in London haven't said if they're following up on the lead. 
To this day, the murder of Jill Dando remains one of the UK's most puzzling and heartbreaking true crime stories. With no clear motive, no solid evidence, and no definitive suspects, it seems this case may never fully be solved. What do you think happened? And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.